Welcome to the Ecosystem Podcast. I'm Sash Mukherjee, Principal Analyst at Ecosystem. And today we have a very special edition because I get to chat with our CEO, Amit Gupta. Amit has been the vision behind the need for disruption in the tech research industry and has led us in our journey to data democratization. Amit, welcome to Ecosystem Podcast. Oh, thank you, Sash. Amit, we recently launched a special study to evaluate the immediate and longer term impact of COVID-19. So let us talk a bit about how COVID has impacted us. I mean, us personally and businesses around the world. Yeah, so Sash, as I have maintained since the start of this pandemic, what we are facing is not just an economic crisis. Uh, Rather, it is first a humanitarian crisis, and of course, the economic crisis is a fallout of it. Um, And COVID, to me, is a watershed moment. And we are seeing years of societal shifts get squeezed into a matter of weeks. Now, there's nothing new in what I'll share, but let me summarize what has happened at a global scale. With stay-at-home orders, office closures, school closures, we're all learning new ways of working, new ways of learning, and also learning how to cope with uh, our new lifestyles. We're learning to engage digitally with people, whether it be our families, our friends, our colleagues, or clients, way beyond uh, what we would have previously, um, and going, to be fair, beyond the borders that we would uh, normally engage within. So I think the crisis has led to a new level of empathy within businesses and leadership. We're also learning the ability to try new things without, wait for it, you've heard this from me many times, Sash, (laughs) without getting perfect, get in the way of better, which is the only way to innovate. You have to keep moving on. And I think one of the things that has come out of this uh, pandemic is that we are all now, uh, we've all got a new new appetite for adoption of technology and digital in a much shorter period of time. I have heard that one before, Amit. Uh, But what I've also heard you say is, uh, you know, there's going to be major global shifts. So what, in your opinion, will encourage these shifts? Do you want to hear the good news or the bad news first? Um, Start with the bad and end on a good note, I say. Okay. I'm I'm certain, Sash, it's all going to end on a good note. And I'm positive and I hope it's all going to end on a good note. But I do want to consider other foundational shifts that have been in play and COVID to me has just been a tipping point. So as an analyst, let me first share some hard hitting numbers. The World Bank is forecasting a 5.2% contraction in global GDP in 2020. That's the deepest global recession in eight decades. According to the ILO, the International Labor Organization, wage hours lost in the second quarter of 2020 due to COVID roughly equated to 400 million full-time jobs. And let's look at wealth inequality. In 2009, the combined wealth of the world's richest 308 people equaled the wealth of the bottom half. And by 2018, just 26 billionaires accounted for as much as the bottom half of humanity. Now, you know, you're seeing completely different levels of wealth creation on one on the one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got this challenge that people are getting more poor, right? So how do you address that? And then of course, there's the big um, climate change. As per the IPCC, global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2052, if nothing is done about it. So since July, 2019, nearly 15 million acres were burned across Australia's six states. Now, try and imagine the size and scale of that. It's equivalent to the uh, size of countries such as Belgium and Haiti combined. Then you've got the geopolitical shifts. There is, um, we're all familiar with what's going on at the moment with TikTok, uh, but that's just a fallout of these geopolitical shifts. It's, It's causing what, being termed as the splintering of the internet. And you're seeing that obviously now in the US, between the US and China, but you've already seen this take shape in the last few weeks in markets such as India and Hong Kong. So, but what I will say is that 
every crisis presents an opportunity. And to me, perhaps an opportunity to reimagine a much brighter world through a digital lens. And I want to quote Andrew Grohl, the co-founder of Intel from his book, Swimming Across. He said, crisis always end. They may take a short time, they may persist for a while, but they will always end. How you prepare during those times of crisis will determine how strong you emerge towards the end of the crisis. So given these foundational shifts, we have to ask ourselves, how do we put humanizing front and center as we consider a digitally enhanced world? So let us talk specifically about the impact on industries. And let's start with governments first, because you know they obviously have a huge role to play in guiding the path to recovery. Absolutely. And look, what's beyond doubt is the significant role technology is going to play in the socioeconomic healing process. That is 100%. Um, I believe that post-COVID, governments will give a determined impetus to dig digitization. In its recent digital resilience budget, the Singapore government, for example, laid a plan to help the economic recovery across F&B and retail. Every organization in those sectors is eligible for a $10,000 grant to invest across HR tech and marketplaces with a significant push on AI and analytics. It's a start and it's a small number till you add up the cumulative opportunity base and spend that this could drive. In my view, governments will need to focus significantly on creating social safety nets. And technology is gonna play a key role in enabling critical services across healthcare, education, um, food security, which, I'll, you know, which I'm gonna to touch on. And then of course, big impact on areas such as public safety and infrastructure, public infrastructure as well. Uh, and which you know, I'd love to touch, touch on with you at a, at a later stage. But at this point, I think the key safe social safety nets that I'll focus on are healthcare, education, and food security. So if we take healthcare as an example, we are going to see an increasing adoption of data capture and utilization. We're gonna see integration of data across silos, and that's gonna be critical. In fact, Sash, I'm preaching to the choir because you know you cover the healthcare sector, uh, but you know that countries such as Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore have already been leveraging the integration of data across healthcare, immigration, as well as location data to tackle the current pandemic. It's only going to become more ubiquitous. Of course, out of all this, data privacy is going to become a key uh, opportunity area, and government will need to push to give greater control of data in the hands of individuals so they can better deal with their healthcare needs in the most optimal manner. That's where they'll need to drive the healthcare uh, sector towards. We've also seen the pandemic overwhelm the, the so-called world-class healthcare systems. And that's forced a much greater adoption of remote health and telemedicine that till now has really been sitting on the periphery. So the crisis has shown us that our health systems currently are not geared to continue caring for other acute and cro chronic disease patients in the event of a pandemic. So while uh, a lot of the healthcare systems and some of the most evolved uh, markets have been dealing with the pandemic, they have unfortunately, it has meant that they've not been able to focus on other chronic patients or acute, um, uh, you know, acute disease patients. So it needs to be addressed now. We saw Malaysia's, um, you know, Malaysian uh, company IHH Healthcare, which is Asia's largest healthcare group. Uh, they made telemedicine available across their key markets globally, including Singapore and Malaysia. And in fact, in March this year, they also invested in the Singapore-based telehealth startup, Doctor Anywhere. So what it means is that their patients are now able to get access to services from consultation to doorstep drug delivery with the option for a transfer to the group's brick and mortar facilities if necessary. Um, education, that's gonna be a big one. I think that there's gonna be huge. Just think about how much we pay for our kids' education. 
in today's environment, whether kids go to a good international school or uh, the cost of education, of college education in some of the more mature markets. So with an average cost of $200,000 for a college education, for example, in the US, COVID is going to ravage that business model. The outcome of that is the education sector is going to pivot. There's no doubt about it. And new models will emerge that will democratize that sector and education is gonna become much more accessible. What that means is hopefully it will help bridge that gap of inequality and create a level playing field. So I'm hoping that technology will become a key game changer and that governments will take this as an opportunity to push that agenda to make education much more accessible uh, to a much broader uh, community. Then you talk about food security and food safety. That's got to be a very, very critical point. Go back three months, we were all concerned and we were all stocking up on canned food and, and, and instant noodles and so on, just in the event that food ran out. This was a reality. It didn't matter whether you were based in India or you were based in New Zealand or you were based in the US. We were all doing that. But fortunately, the first thing that governments did across the board, and you've got to give them credit for it, is they sorted out supply chains for food assurance. And to me, this is an opportunity to take this to the next level. This renewed focus on supply chain resilience will be a shot in the arm for supply chain transparency, reducing food frauds and enhancing food safety. It will also lead to greater adoption of agri-tech in areas such as blockchain, IoT, analytics, and automation. So I think the opportunity for us is we have to start treating issues more objectively. So what agri-tech and food security and food safety means in a market such as Australia or New Zealand uh, or Singapore for that matter is very different from what it means in markets like India and perhaps Sri Lanka and some other parts of Africa. Um, because in some instances, it's not just a question of getting, uh, being able to validate and have a secure supply chain to be able to um, validate the origins. It's also a question of making sure that you enhance the supply chain so that you can actually get the produce from the farm to the folk. Because in some of the emerging markets, you know, the, the situation we have is the food just doesn't make it to the, um, to the table. 90% of food in some of these emerging markets rots. So governments do have to put in a new focus on that and it can't happen with governments alone. I think it has to be a public-private partnership. New models should emerge that will help enable these. Right. So let's look beyond governments now and think about the impact on other industries. Well, for, look, for simplicity and in the interest of time, I've clustered the industries into three buckets, thriving, transforming, and depleting. For the first two categories, we have used a digital propensity score from our ongoing ecosystem COVID research. For the third category, my view is they will take a long time, if at all, to get back to their original form. And we need three more months to better understand the way forward in the long term. So I've kind of left the digital propensity score off those. In the interest of time, I want to share a few examples from sectors, uh, including banking, retail, and hospitality. Um, let's start with banking and fintech. As you know, Sash, this is a sector I'm very passionate about, and having been so closely involved as the official thought leadership partners for the Singapore Fintech Festival, it has given us at Ecosystem a ringside view of the pace of transformation in the sector. And it's not just the fintech startups, though that are reshaping the industry. The speed and agility that tradi traditional banks are moving with to become digital powerhouses it is, is even more promising. But let me first take the example of one of the most promising fintechs, Revolut. Since their launch in 2015, Revolut has managed to build a small army of diehard fans among its 12 million customers. And they've got a cult-like status. What's driving the uptake of their offerings is the social referrals. They actually have revolute parties for these fans to get together in, in, in their core, core markets. So it's a very different way of driving that um, and, and growing the market. But then let's look at the traditional banks. I'm 
as I said, really impressed with what they're doing. And consider the fact that it actually takes less clicks to open an account with OCBC in Singapore than it does with Revolut. Now that is staggering. And this is an industry that to me will be guided by customer experience at its core, and they are willing to go all in with respect to the use of data and automation. And the good news is regulators such as MAS in Singapore, Bank Nagara in Malaysia, for example, um, are all right behind the sector in making that a reality. I also want to share um, an offbeat example of the retail sector. And I've, I've, I've chosen an example specifically in an area of health and wellness. So the Peloton bike, they're among the pioneers in disrupting the health and wellness sector. What it basically is, is a high-end indoor bicycle rigged with a Wi-Fi enabled 22 inch touchscreen tablet that streams live into your living room or into your dining room. And you can have on-demand classes and it allows the rider to compete with other participants in real time. It's amazing how the immersive experience coupled with the timing of the pandemic has the opportunity to transform this industry. And this is not the only example. We will see number of new examples in retail where the entire experience is going to be pivoting around that immersive experience, augmenting reality with what we can um, experience only virtually today, but making it much more holistic. I do want to touch on the travel and hospitality sector as well, because you know they've got their backs up against the wall and I do feel for them. As for the International Labor Organization, the travel sector is going to account for an overall job loss of approximately 65 million jobs across Asia Pacific alone. Now that's staggering, but it is impressive to see the resilience in the sector and how the sector is responding to the pandemic. And they are showing early signs of potential new business models. As an example, I don't know if you've received it, I've been getting regular email promotions from the Ascot Hotels in Malaysia who are offering me the experience of work from hotel. Now, that's a great respite for people who don't have a conducive work environment from home. They're not able to go into their office or they simply need a change for a, for a while. So maybe it's a new term being coined there, Sash, called workation, which basically is kind of what we do every day. We basically end up mo spending most of our time working anyway. So even when we are on vacation, most of us do end up working, but maybe there's, some, there's a new term out there called workation, which is, um, you know, take a nice hotel room and work from there for a few days, just for, uh, just for a change of scene. Now, but this is not a trend just in Malaysia. We've seen this across other markets as well. There are new models emerging. And, but the thing is from a technology standpoint, what it means is these business model shifts will require new digital channels to market, new booking engines. The service offerings within the hotels will need to change to operate, offer corporate services. And this will require a revamp of their overall digital strategy at some point. Although if I was a vendor, I would probably hold back a little bit before trying to sell them something. Right. Amit, it's always a pleasure talking to you, more so this time in a more formal setting. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Sash. Thanks all for listening. Uh, do log on to our platform for more insights from our COVID study. Due to ecosystem's model of continuous data collection, the study is receiving responses now as we speak from around the world. If you are a tech buyer, you will be able to receive your own contextualized research in real time on participation. Till next time, stay safe.